Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here at this, uh, this, this joint event. I want to thank the organizers uh, immensely for, for inviting me. Um, I, I think sometimes, sometimes I think, right, that the sort of safest general characterization of, of the human race is, well, I'm this sort of ghastly middle class species. We're always worried about our, our status. I suspect it's a sort of hangover from the, the great chain of being when we were uh, below the angels but above the animals. And so, we, um, m many people, you know, we, we always find ourselves looking for some sort of difference that uh, decisively separates us from other animals. Um, and various candidates have been offered by various people at various times, you know, immortal soul, rationality, tool use, tool making, morality, play, etc. Et but um, I, I think, you know, if, if we were a little, a little more self-aware self species, um, then we realize it's actually very easy to identify the difference uh, that decisively separates us from all other, all other creatures. We're the species that is always worried about decisively distinguishing ourselves from other animals. I mean, no, no other animal worries about that. But the problem is, I mean, it's, it's got to be right, like, it's got to be true, but the problem is this is um, insuff insufficiently, let's say, elevating, because really what we, what we, what, what we want it's not just a point of difference, but we want to be better than, than they are. So, um, in this book, uh, that was, <laughs> whose title was, 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 was just debated, I think it would have been much better as a wolf and a philosopher, actually, because, uh, for obvious reasons. But um, the publishers didn't, didn't, didn't want to go with that. But anyway, in this book that was frighteningly written, that came out about nearly 10 years ago now, I, I, um, it was a sort of de uh, a memoir of a kind of decade or so I spent living and, and uh, traveling with, with an animal uh, called Brennan, who was, who was sold to me as a wolf. Um, I think it's quite likely he was a wolf dog mix, but whatever he was, uh, he was cool. Um, but part of what the book was, uh, was a sort of um, an examination of these ways we distinguish ourselves from other creatures. Looking at what I think are uh, generally the big three, intelligence, um, Mortality, in the sense of our own finitude, if you like, and uh, morality. And for the purposes of, of, of that book, um, I was quite happy to accept, just you know, for the sake of argument, that we have these sorts of things in ways that, that other animals don't. And what I was interested in there was the, what, what, these, what these features say uh, about us. And the idea was they don't say very good things at all. If you look at intelligence, at the core or the root of intelligence, we find um, deception and lies. Um, mortality, will have a sense of mortality, well, that just makes us unhappy. And morality, uh, I, I argue that at the core of morality, we find things like power and, uh, and deceit. Um, but in recent years, I, I've been sort of rethinking this morality thing. And I, I, I think um, the idea that morality is, is an exclusively human preserve um, is very, very questionable, to say the least. So what I'm going to look at tonight is, is a sort of a, an idea who's, that's, that's been around, um, certainly at least since Darwin. Um, Darwin, uh, I, th I think, didn't say what he should have said, but he did say some very interesting things about um, the possibility of moral behavior in, in animals. But still, although in, in the sense of man, um, we find some very nice descriptions of behavior that, that might possibly be moral. Darwin didn't want to go that far. He, he, he concluded with this. Um, a moral being, he wrote, is one who is capable of reflecting on his past actions and their motives, of, of approving of some and disapproving of others. And the fact that man is the one being who certainly deserves this designation is the greatest of all distinctions between him and the lower uh, animals. So um, that's that's the idea I'm gonna I'm gonna explore. So using uh, I think what is probably the biggest single repository of um, evidence for, for, for moral behavior in animals, uh, namely YouTube, um, it, might, it might be interesting to, to see what uh, Darwin would think of, of behavior like this. And he gets hit, and is now just lying in the middle of this busy highway, 
and a second dog spots him and tries to get over to him. And here's the first dog again being hit. He's lying there in the middle of the road, busy time up the highway, and here comes the second dog who grabs him, not by him with his teeth, but actually gets him with his paws around his neck and drags him in the middle of all this traffic off the road to safety, little by little, inch by inch. Finally, some workers spot the dogs and come over and help them. And by the way, the injured dog lived. I, I, I hate to, I, I, yeah, I, I hate to be a bring with bad news. I, I don't think that's true about last bit, actually. But, uh, this, uh, sorry. Were they, this happened in, in Chile, um, San Diego, Chile. Yeah. Um, or um, have, have a look at this. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is this is. Sort of, I'm not saying that any of these things I'm showing you are definitely moral behaviour. What I'm trying to make make a case for the moment is the idea that they they at least raise the possibility. So, see so, so you think of this. Oh, sorry. observations of photographs due to uh, someone called Ian Douglas Hamilton. Um, the the, the fallen elephant is, is uh, an elephant named Eleanor, at least that's what the, the, the observers uh, called her. Eleanor's, Eleanor is old, her, her time is up and she, she's fallen down. Um, the, the other animal, the, the other elephant is, is named Grace. Um, from a different family, Grace is of the Virtues family, Eleanor is of the, the First Lady family, so different families of elephants. Um, uh, initially, Grace manages to help uh, Eleanor back to her, her feet, um, but unfortunately this doesn't really last very long, and uh, she, d down again she goes. Um, this is the following morning, Grace is now the elephant in the background, this, this, this elephant at the front is called Maui, of a, a, yet another family of elephants, the Hawaiian Islands family. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't end uh, well for, for, for Eleanor, sadly. Uh, there she is. She's been de-tusked, de, de basically, not, not by poachers, but by uh, the, the people working on the reserve to, to discourage uh, posters. Um, so, again, the question is, well, when Grace is trying to help Eleanor, um, could this be understood as a kind of moral behavior? Um, this, is, this is a gorilla named Binti Jua, um, who became famous briefly in um, 96 when, when a boy fell into her uh, enclosure. Um, she, as you can see, she, she basically cradles the boys in her arms and eventually takes him to a sort of access door where the keepers can, can um, retrieve him. Um, now, you would think that falling into gorilla enclosures is a fairly rare occurrence, but in fact, it seems to happen all the time. I mean, here's, here's another example of... Um, I apologize for the quality of the sound on this one, actually. Um, but I think you'll be able to see what's going on. Giant. 
Anyway, uh, here's, here's one you might have seen. I, I don't know. I think this is in uh, Hungary. Um, engaging in what's called a furtive be behavior or after, after a fight, uh, either the, the, the two uh, bonobos who are fighting or maybe a third party, often a third party, um, giving a, a seemingly consoling hug after a, a squabble. I think, I, I suspect many of you may have seen this one. This is Franz de Waal's, um, an experiment run by Sarah Brosnan and Franz de Waal on uh, equity, on so-called equity, uh, aver inequity aversion in um, monkeys. Uh, <laughs> it's quite a well-known one, this. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber. Can you hear this? Did we, I don't think we, we, we hooked up the side. Can you hear OK, what's being said? Or? No. OK, what's going on? Right? They're, 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 they're two monkeys. They're, they're, do, they're, they're performing the same task. Um, but one, one, one monkey is rewarded with a highly prized grape, and the other is rewarded with a not at all prized uh, piece of cucumber. Okay, so, so, um, so see what you think of the, you, you, I, I'm sure you can guess which one is which. <laughs> the other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it, the other one sees that. She gives the rock to us now, gets the cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets the cucumber again. Okay. Now, um, I don't know if, 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 if as, you know, if any of you have young children out there, I think it'd be fascinating to run the same kind of experiment on them. I, I, <laughs> Shamefully, I, I, I tried it with my two once, um, and it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, a very, very similar kind of response. Um, anyway, so the question, right, which, which you, uh, the question is, um, can behaviors of, of this sort be understood in, in moral terms? Are these animals uh, acting morally? Um, and there are two, there are two issues, really, that, that arise. One is a so-called empirical issue about um, whether there's enough evidence to support the claim that the behaviors are moral ones. Perhaps there's some alternative explanation of this behavior. So I, I once, when I, when, I, um, when I was showing the, the, the dog with the fish example, I mean, one, one animal scientist said this is merely caching behavior, you know, burying something, you know, for a tree. I mean, I would have thought, I mean, I really would have thought that a dog is smart enough to know that you can't cache anything with, with water. But, but you know, that, that's an example of, you know, a sort of alternative explanation that someone might, might come up with. Um, but there's, there's also another issue, um, which is, is a sort of a conceptual issue about what it means to, to act morally. So the issue here is what, what conditions must be met for um, a behavior to qualify as a moral one? So the thesis I want to defend tonight is, is that the possibility of animals behaving morally is one that should be taken seriously. Um, there are no compelling objections to the possibility of moral behavior in animals. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to try and um, convince you of tonight. 
So Dar Darwin, um, in, in The Descent of Man, made some very interesting observations, put, collected very, various interesting observations about behavior in animals that seems like it might have some sort of moral um, aspect. And Darwin said this, any animal whatever endowed with well marked, any animal whatever endowed with well marked social instincts, the, the parental and filial affections being here included, would inevitably acquire a moral sense or conscience as soon as his mental powers had become as well or nearly as well developed as in man. Um, but he said, so so far it sounds okay, animals behaving morally is, 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 is a possibility. But, he says, and there's always a but, a moral being is one who is capable of comparing his past and future actions or motives and of approving or disapproving of them. We have no reason to suppose that any of the lower animals have this capacity. Therefore, when a Newfoundland dog drags a child out of the water, or a monkey faces danger to rescue its comrade, or takes charge of an orphan monkey, we do not call its conduct moral. And um, this is the earlier quotation. Uh, a moral being is one who is capable of reflecting, thinking about his past actions and their motives, of approving of some and disapproving of others. And the fact that man is the one being who certainly deserves his designation is the greatest of all distinctions between him and the lower animals. So in Darwin, what you find is, 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 is the idea that animals, they're not, they're not probably moral beings. They do possess the building blocks of morality, but they're not moral beings as such. They don't really act morally. They have some of the rudiments or building blocks of moral behavior, but it's not really moral behavior. And um, this is a theme that in recent years has been championed by Vance de Waal, uh, who, 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 who essentially takes the same line as Darwin. Uh, his reason why animals are not really moral beings, his, his explanation is this. In the course of human evolution, that group hostility enhanced in-group solidarity to the point that mor morality emerged. Instead of me merely ameliorate, ameliorating relations around us, as apes do, we have explicit teachings about the, pres about the value of community and the precedence it takes, or ought to take, over, human, over individual interests. Humans go much further in all of this than the apes, which is why we have moral systems and they do not. That's from his book, Primates and Philosophers. So again, with Duval, you get essentially the Darwin line. The, the, the building blocks of morality, the evolutionary building blocks of morality are present in some animals, um, but you don't really have morality in, in, in the full-blown sense. Um, Mark Begoff and Jessica Pierce, in a very nice book called Wild Justice, um, well, they argued that animals can act morally, but they, they qualified this by saying that what counts as moral behavior is varies from one species to another. Um, so humans act morally in one way, animals act morally in another way. Um, I think that concedes too much, actually. I'm going to try and convince you. That this, this, this was a, a sort of um, the position I, I, I defended in a book called Can Animals Be Moral? What, what I argued there and what I'll argue tonight is that animals not merely possess the building blocks of morality, um, Condra, Darwin, and Duval, um, they can actually act morally. Uh, moreover, contrary to uh, Beckhoff and Pierce, animals can act morally in the same way that humans act morally. Humans can have certain ways of acting morally that animals don't, but there is at least one way of acting morally, and humans and animals do it in the same, the same way. Um, this, this claim has, has, has been thought to be, you know, by, by all philosophers, uh, pretty much, and um, all, or pretty much all scientists, too. This, this has, has been regarded as, as just impossible. Um, and the reason for this impossibility, th there are two different kinds of reason you get which, which tend to sort of overlap and reinforce each other. So one, there's this idea of control that people have and they associate it strongly with morality. Um, so the idea is that animals can't control what they do and to be moral you have to be able to control your behavior. Because animals can't do it, they can't act morally. So that's the control theme. Uh, there's also an understanding theme, 
which, which basically claims that animals don't understand what they're doing, and to be moral, you need to be able to understand what you do. Um, usually, these themes can be taken separately. Often, um, control is explained in terms of understanding. So I want to look at each of these sort of two ideas and argue that they, they're not as convincing as they, they might seem. I mean, th th there's one thing about the control, the control issue which I think is, is right. I mean, um, perhaps some of you know this, I don't know. But at one time, I mean, courts of law set up to try and uh, subsequently sentence animals for, for some uh, perceived infraction were, were, were not uncommon, right? So here's some poor poor donkey has been brought up before the, the magistrate for some heinous uh, crime. And, you know, if, if um, there's something about this which, which seems, you know, a bit silly, right? And I think what's underlying is the idea that control implies responsibility um, and, the po and, and, the, and the possibility of praise and blame. So one th if things don't go well, when, you have, when, when, when the animal has its day in court, things don't go well, then they were often subsequently sort of executed um, for, for, for their crimes. I mean, I, I really don't know what animal is supposed to be depicted here. It looks like a kind of giant shrew, but I, I suspect it might be intended to be a pig, but, but whatever it is. So I'm, I'm assuming, right, that we'll probably agree that this is just stupid, okay? Uh, we don't want to go back to the days of criminal court set up to try animals or executions if things go badly or anything like that. So, for the sake of argument, let's accept that animals are not responsible for what they do. Uh, and let's accept, again for the sake of argument, that they're not responsible for what they do because they can't control what they do. The question then is, does this mean they can't behave morally? Um, or in other words, is morality impossible without control? Well, possibly the, the world's most famous moral philosopher ever, possibly. Um, some, a, a guy called Immanuel Kant certainly thought morality was impossible without control. Kant claimed that ought implies can. Um, it, it, it makes no sense to say you ought to do something if you can't do it. Um, and it makes no sense to say you ought not to do something if you can't help it. So um, using this, this sort of Kantian theme or meme, um, you, could run, you, you could develop an argument against the idea that animals could be moral based on their lack of control. So the argument would look like this. A morally good motivation is one that you ought to act on. A morally bad motivation is one that you ought to resist. But following Kant, it makes no sense to say that you ought to do something if you can't do it. Um, no morality, in other words, without control. Um, therefore, a motivation can't be a good or bad one unless you have control over it. Um, this, I think, is, 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 not a good, is not a good argument. And um, as a beginning at seeing why it's not a good argument, I think I, I'm following a suggestion made by Thomas Nagel in another context, a, a philosopher, a moral philosopher. So, I mean, here's a prudential lot. Uh, you know, um, this person should apparently not drink so much, let's suppose, but it may well be that he couldn't control himself. Um, so, when we're dealing with the prudential or the order of prudence, there's little temptation to suppose that this prudential ought requires control. So, why suppose that the moral ought does? Here's another ought, the logical ought. Doesn't matter what any of this means. P, P and Q here are um, they're supposed to represent any random sentences. Um, the key point is, uh, this is something called De Morgan's theorem, actually. But the key point is, if you believe the left-hand side, then you ought to believe the right-hand side, and vice versa. Okay. Um, but well, we, perhaps we just can't see we can't see the equivalence. Um, so you ought, if, if you believe the left-hand side, you ought to believe the right-hand side, but you may just not be able to. Okay. So um, it's certainly it's still true that you ought to believe the right-hand side if you. Um, if you believe the left, you ought logically. So the order of logic doesn't imply can. Okay? So 
with that in mind, return to the moral ought. Why suppose, why suppose that ought implies can in the moral case? Um, there are actually good reasons for supposing that ought doesn't imply can, even in the moral case. Um, there are two. There, there, there's one scenario, and th th this is what philosophers call a thought experiment. Um, so th th these are two thought experiments. The first is what I'll call a determinism world, and the second is uh, evil children. We'll get to them in a moment. Um, so universal determinism in philosophy is the view that basically everything's inevitable. Everything that exists or occurs has a cause. Causes make their effects inevitable. Therefore, it quickly follows that everything is inevitable. So uh, if, if determinism is right, uh, then everything you've done, all the choices you've made, um, all the actions you've, you, you've undertaken and so on, these were all inevitable. You didn't have any control over them. Okay? Now, suppose, suppose that is the way the world is, and many people think it is the way the world is. Uh, if that were the case, then no one would have any ultimate control over, over what he or she does. Um, but does it follow from that that they can never have moral motivations? Well, that would seem strange, right? Because, um, I mean, take, take your example of, you know, the, just construct whatever list of the most evil people in history, um, people who've, who've done terrible things on the basis of terrible motivations. Um, would we really want to conclude from determinism being true that these people um, didn't have bad motivations, evil motivations. I, I, th I think that would, that, would be, uh, that would be a very strange uh, interpretation. Okay? The, more, the, the more natural interpretation is, okay, these people, um, they had evil motivations, they did evil things, they may, not, they may not be blameworthy because no one ultimately has any control, but that doesn't stop the motivations being um, morally bad ones. So what we have to do then, I think, is abandon the idea that ought implies can even in the moral case. Um, or in other words, a motivation can be, can be, morally good or, 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 can be a morally good or a bad one, even if you have no control over whether you have it or whether you act on it. Okay. Um, here's, here's a very, a very sad case. This happened in, in, in Britain in the early 90s. Uh, these, these two children, John Venables and Robert Thompson, uh, abducted and murdered a three-year-old boy called Jamie Bulger. And I, um, I use this example um, because we're, we're, we're familiar because of their, 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 their later, te their later um, admissions. We, it's clear that they, th th this action wasn't just a random or spontaneous thing. They planned this. They planned for, for days in advance to, abdu to abduct a child that day uh, from a shopping center and kill him. The original plan, they said, was to push him in, into traffic and, you know, and get, get him run over. Um, but then this, this, this aspect of their plan changed and they abducted him. They, 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 they beat him with metal rods and so on and um, when he so, so many times that it was it was a, it was impossible to determine to determine which was the killing blow and then after that um, when 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 Jamie Bulger was dead they put his body on on a railway line in the hope that people would think it was just an awful accident um, so here we, here we have I think clear examples of morally um, abhorrent motivations now suppose um, I think Venables and Thompson were around about eight or nine at the time. So suppose, as many people say, at that age, they don't really have any control over what they do. They're below, they're below the age of sort of moral responsibility and so on. Even if that were true, and you, you, it doesn't really matter whether it's true, I'm saying even if it is true, then it would not follow from that that the motivations of Venables and Thompson were not morally uh, abhorrent ones. There's still morally bad motivations, even if there was no control. So once again, um, we have to abandon the idea, I think, that, that the moral ought implies can. The, so and, and once we do that, then there's no reason for supposing that an animal's lack of control over what it does disqualifies the animal from being a moral being. Um, so it's common in, um, th there's a well-known distinction between what, what are called moral patients and moral agents. 
And uh, you, you, basically the idea is you're, you're not a patient if and only if. You're, you're a proper or legitimate object of moral concern. So someone who's doing something that sort of impacts or affects you, they have to, morally speaking, take into account uh, the impact that their behavior has on you. So the basic case for animal rights is, is that you know, animals are clearly moral patients. Um, they clearly have some sort of moral status. People can disagree about how far this, this status extends, how broad the scope is, and so on. But only a psychopath, I think, would, would deny that animals have any moral status at all. So clearly, animals are moral patients. Um, a moral agent, on the other hand, you're a moral agent if you're, if you're responsible, morally responsible for what you do. And so it can be morally evaluated are praised or blamed, roughly, for your motives and, and actions. And it may well be that other, other animals are, are, are not moral agents. And it may well be that, in fact, we're not moral agents either, but uh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, the important point for our purposes is that once we, once we break this connection between morality and control, then we need a new, a new category that's not the same as the category of the moral patient or the moral agent. And this category is, is that of the, what, what I call the moral subject. So the idea is you're a moral subject if and only if uh, you are at least sometimes motivated to act by moral considerations. And crucially, you can be a moral subject even if you're not a moral agent. So even if we accept, because we don't want to go back to criminal trials and executions of animals, even if we accept that animals are not responsible for what they do, they can still be moral subjects. Um, they can still act on the basis of moral motivations. Um, okay. The other, the other theme was, was understanding. This is a theme that some people use to deny that animals can act morally. It's a sort of forgive them love, they know, not, they, they know not what they do kind of sort of theme. So the idea, is you, the idea here is you can't be moral unless you understand you're being moral. Um, and some the understanding and control, they, they could be separate, but usually um, they reinforce each other. Understanding is often taken to be the, the basis of control. So this way of thinking about morality goes back to, to Aristotle. Who said things like this? Um, but for actions in, a, in accord with the virtues to be done transparently or justly, it does not suffice that they themselves have the right qualities. Rather, the agent must also be in the right state when he does them. First, he must know that he is doing virtuous actions. Second, he must decide on them and decide on them for themselves. And third, he must also do them from a firm and unchanging state. So first, he must... To be a virtuous, a morally virtuous person, you have to act, um, you have to know that what you're doing is the virtuous thing to do. And secondly, this decide on them and decide on them for themselves. What that's generally taken to mean is that you have to, you have to do this morally virtuous thing because you want to be morally virtuous. So to be moral, you have to understand that something is a good thing to do and you must do it because you want to do the good thing. Um, and this, this theme, again, is, is widely, uh, widely reiterated in, in, in much philosophy. This, this is Christine Korsgaard, a, a well-known contemporary Kantian philosopher, who uh, says things like this. As rational beings, we're conscious of the principles on which we're inclined to act. Because of this, we have the ability to ask ourselves whether we should act in the way we're instinctively inclined to. We can say to ourselves, I'm inclined to do act A for the sake of ND, but should I? In other words, when we have motivations, we can say, look, I'm motivated to do this. I'm inclined to do this. Is this a motivation I should resist, or is it a motivation I should embrace? We can do that. Other animals can't. Um, of course, God assumes, and that is why we, we are moral creatures and they are not. Um, so the general Aristotle canned line on understanding is this. Animals cannot reflect on their motivations. They cannot say, okay, I'm inclined to do this. I'm motivated to do this. Should I resist this motivation or should I go with it? They can't do that, therefore, um, 
They can't ask themselves whether these are good or bad motivations, whether they should embrace or resist them, and therefore animals' motivations are not moral ones. So many people have argued. The question is, 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 this, is this plausible? To, to, to be moral, to be a moral being, do you have to understand what you're doing? Do you have to be able to scrutinize your motivations, think, is this a good motivation I should act on, or is this a bad motivation I should resist? Do you have to be able to think things like, um, I'm, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do when I want to do the right thing? Do you have to be able to think in that way in order to qualify as uh, moral? So. To, to, to see why I think it's not, it's not plausible, um, this, this, um, imagine a case of someone we'll call Mishkin, you know, loosely based on the Dostoevsky character. So Mishkin is just a very nice person. He rejoices in the happiness of others and tries to promote the happiness whenever he can. Uh, conversely, he's made miserable by the sadness of others and tries to mitigate their sadness, tries to reduce their sadness whenever possible, and so on and so on. And this is not a one-off thing. He does this all the time because that's the sort of person he is. Um, but Mishkin, for whatever reason, is unable to think about or scrutinize his motivations. He can't think things like, is this a good motivation? Is this one I should endorse? Or is this one I should reject? And so on. He can't do that because he's not sufficiently Men, uh, in intellectually sophisticated enough to do it. So we might, we might, contrast, um, we might contrast the case of Mishkin with someone we can call Marlowe. After the, the skilled scrutinizer of motivations you find in, in many of Joseph Conrad's novels. So Marlowe is the sort of subject of the sort that Aristotle and Kant would approve on. He can think about his motivations, he can decide to do things because he decides it's the right thing and he wants to do the right thing and so on. So here's a picture, right? It's, it's a tempting picture in that almost everyone has been tempted by it. Um, in, the mercy of the, in the absence of the ability to critically scrutinize his motivations, Mishkin, Mishkin is sort of at the mercy of his motivations. His motivations push him this way, they push him that way. Um, but he has no awareness of the role they play, so he is at the sort of um, he's at the mercy of his motivations. But critical scrutiny, people say, transforms Marlowe. Marlowe can sit above his motivations. He can look down on them, observe them, judge them, and evaluate them, and therefore decide how much these motivations are going to push him to action or or not. Um, so the idea is that this sort of critical scrutiny gives Marlowe control over his motivations. Um, that is a very common line of argument and one you, you, you often find used to attack the idea that, that, that animals can be moral. Um, animals are at the mercy of their motivations because they cannot think about them and therefore cannot evaluate them. Um, the problem, I think, with, the, with this line of argument is that there's no reason to suppose that Marlowe's judgments of his motivations are any different from the motivations themselves. Perhaps these judgments are ones over, over which he has little control, for example, being um, perhaps because they're, they're, they're features of a situation that he only sort of dimly grasps and so on and so on. Um, if so, then giving Marlowe the ability to evaluate his motivations now just merely makes him victim to his evaluations of the motivations and not the, the motivations themselves. So there's, there's a well-known position in social psychology which, which can be used as an example of, of this sort of um, point. Um, it's difficult to know what to think about social psychology these days. There's a kind of crisis of replication going on. So, so I, I won't sort of invest too much weight in, in this. But according to the view known as situationism developed by people like Philip Zimbardo and so on, then when you change a situation, the subject's tendencies to evaluate their motivations in one way rather than another will also change. So, so Zimbardo set up a, the famous um, Stanford prison experiment in 1970 where um, Groups of student volunteers were, were, were randomly divided up into prisoners and guards. 
um, left in the basement for a while, and uh, and it, it quickly emerged that the, the the guards were starting to act in unnecessarily brutal ways and so on. And after after a fairly short time, even though they were all just students, and this was a completely sort of random role playing assignment. Zimbardo argued the same kind of the same kind of fact you find in places like Abu Ghraib. Um, so, if the situationist account is, is is right, then we should expect. Marlowe's evaluation of his motivations to vary with these, um, these variations in circumstance. But it doesn't really matter whether situation is, is right, because what we have here is a basic logical problem. And the logical problem is this. The very issue of control that arises at the, the, the level of motivations, suppose then you bring in the ability to evaluate those motivations, well, the same issue of control arises at the next level up arises at the level of the evaluation of motivations. Um, nothing, nothing miraculous or magical happens when you go from one level of explanation to another. If you have a problem at this level, then the chances are the problem will be, unless you, you, you take steps to avoid this, the chances are the same problem will be replicated at the next level up. Um, therefore, I think we should conclude that the control over motivation is, is, is not required um, for that motivation to count as moral. This is so for two reasons. It's doubtful, uh, sorry, control over motivation is not required for motivation to qualify as moral, and it's also doubtful that control can be explained in terms of understanding. So the two main reasons that, historically speaking, have been cited for thinking that animals can't be moral, these issues of control and understanding, they, they ultimately do not, do not work. Um, there is actually, and this is, I'm, I'm drawing to a sort of, drawing the whole thing to, to, to a conclusion now. Um, there, is, there, is, there is a way of thinking about morality which makes it perfectly, perfectly sensible, in fact I think almost required to think that animals are moral. The kind of, the, the kind of views of morality that deny the, the possibility of moral behavior in animals are the views that derive from Kant and um, Aristotle, the sort of views which, which require, um, which the close association between moral behavior and control and understanding. But there's, there's, there's a very different way of thinking about, about ethics, um, which derives from this guy, a guy called David Hume, who um, developed a view known as sentimentalism. It's the idea that, that moral, uh, morality is basically a, a, a matter of sentiments. Um, so we can take Hume's, we can take sort of Hume's account um, and instead of thinking in terms of control and understanding and so on, think in terms of what we might call morally laden emotions. Sentimentalism is the idea that, that morality is all to do with having emotions about certain things in certain circumstances and so on. So examples of um, morally laden emotions would be things like compassion and sympathy and toleration, uh, and grief, and uh, you know, negative things like jealousy, malice, and spite, and so on. Um, and the idea behind Hume's sentimentalist account, very roughly, um, is that these, emo these, these emotions can provide reasons, moral reasons, for behavior, for action. So if animals can have these sorts of emotions, uh, and if they can act on the basis of these sorts of emotions, then they can certainly be moral beings um, in at least one of the ways we are. So if, if, if the sentimentalist account is right, then at least some animals can act for moral reasons and do so in the same kind of way that we do. So you might think of, um, you might think of it in these terms. This, this, is, this, this is a sort of sentimentalist view of, of morality. Um, conditions of moral motivation look something like this. First, an individual, a human or otherwise, will qualify as a moral subject, um, that is something capable of acting for moral reasons, if it meets the following conditions. First, they're sensitive, and by sensitive I, I mean I'm capable of detecting at least some of the good-making and bad-making features of, si of, of situations or the environment. So pain, for example, 
would be, in general, a bad-making feature of the environment. Happiness would be a good-making feature. So um, part of what's required for moral, to, to be a moral being, to act morally, is you have some kind of this, this sort of sensitivity to features um, of the environment that are morally salient. Things like happiness versus suffering. Um, and second, they respond emotionally to this, this detection. So like, like Mishkin, you know, they're happy when they detect good-making features and are unhappy when they detect bad-making features. They're happy when other people are happy, they're, they're, they're unhappy when other people are sad, and so on and so on. So we have sensitivity that takes a, a specifically emotional form. Um, and this emotional response is, is reliable because it's grounded in some kind of reliable neural mechanism. Things called mirror neurons are probably the most plausible, um, most plausible candidates for these, these, um, these neural mechanisms. So the idea is that when they, if an animal can act on the basis of this kind of emotional response, then animals can legitimately um, be thought of as acting for moral reasons. Um, one final point. The question is, well, why, why does this matter? <laughs> Which, I, when you think about it, I might have brought up at the beginning of the thing of it. But uh, <laughs> let me try and convince you that it does matter. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult question because, you know, most, <laughs> most of the good we can count in, in, in this world of, of, uh, that we live in, most of the good that we can do for animals requires only that they're moral patients, right? Um, and there's a very good reason for this. It's, it's because at the moment we treat them so badly, the best thing we can do for them is just stop doing that. Okay, that's a function of how badly we treat them, I think, rather than uh, anything else. Um, but to think of animals as merely moral patients, I think, um, involves a, a residual form of prejudice. It's not giving um, many animals the, amount, the sort of respect they're due as, as creatures that can act for moral reasons. So it's a sort of failure to respect the animal as the, the kind of being, being it is. So, um, part of what, if, if a creature has moral capabilities, then by diverting them, p perverting them, um, then we are, we're harming that creature, even if uh, it's quite happy. There, there are forms of harm that, that, that an animal can suffer in virtue of being a moral creature, a moral subject, that um, to thwart or, or, or pervert those, those capabilities is inflicting a sort of harm on that creature, which is quite independent of the amount of suffering or enjoyment in its life. Um, if you take a dog and you train it to, to be vicious and to attack other dogs and fight, then the dog probably isn't going to be happy anyway. But even if it were, there would still be a harm that's being done to this dog. The harm consists in di perverting certain natural moral capabilities it has. Um, this, this to, to, just to, to, to finish up, I mean, this, this is a, a guy called Hugo. He, he sadly died last Christmas, but um, Hugo was, was um, I, I sort of brought Hugo as, well, you know, a first birthday present for my son, basically. That was the spin I put on it. But um, when, when, when you're a dog growing up with two um, young boys, uh, you have to be very, very patient very uh, tolerant. Um, and I was always kind of amazed by the kind of um, concern, toleration, solicitude, patience, and so on Hugo uh, exhibited towards those, my, my sons, uh, even when they're doing things like playing dentist with him and things like that, you know. It's, uh, I mean, the, 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 and, and these things, you know, patience, concern, solicitude, tolerance, um, these, these are moral qualities. And there's a kind of, um, there's something that, you could put it, you could put it this way. Um, it's a good thing that the world contains individuals like that, okay? 
when, when uh, an individual like that exists in the world, that is a good thing for the world um, in general, specifically for the little parts of the, the world he interacts with. But it's a good thing that the world contains um, something like that. Um, in, a, in a way that's kind of, I think, analogous to, but not, not quite the same, but analogous to, to the way that it's a good thing when um, an artist of great talent for example, appears. The world is a better place, we sometimes say, for having that person in it. I think the same is true, you know, of, of, of individuals, human or animal, that are morally, um, morally good. The world is a better place for um, having them in it. And um, we might do, using the sort of distinction between moral agents and moral subjects, we, we, we might distinguish um, between what we might call praise and respect. This is a kind of just a suggestion. So we can say we praise someone that is responsible for what they do. Um, but even, even if someone is like, you know, Mishkin or Hugo, um, then you could, and, and they're just acting on the basis of the way they are, um, then you can still respect them, even if the notion of praise doesn't quite work because you say they're not responsible. There is still there's a kind of respect, a kind of moral respect that goes with um, individuals of uh, of that sort. Uh, thank you.